Welcome to today's episode of Return on Podcast. Tyler Jeffcoat here with Seller Accountant, and I'm going to welcome you to today's episode. We're going to be talking about mindset, business strategy, and we're going to be doing it with one of the thought leaders in the Amazon space, Neil Twa from Voltage. He has a great podcast called The High Voltage Podcast. He's also the author of an amazing book called Almost Automated Income with FBA. Listen a little bit to the podcast. He has a special offer for you if you want to try to grab a free copy of that book. But we're going to wrestle with questions like, is it still a good time to get into e-commerce? Are the product categories on Amazon too saturated? And I think what I found to be the most useful part of this discussion is, how do you construct a winning product launch, brand launch strategy? So, you know, Neil says a lot in this discussion, and it is so act and rich with information. I hope you enjoy this interview with Neil Twa from Voltage. It's time to maximize profitability and cash flow. It's time to learn habits and hacks from the best e-com CEOs. It's time for Return on Podcast with me, Tyler Jeffcoat. All right, guys, welcome to today's episode of Return on Podcast. And guys, I'm excited. I like talking to my friends in the space, getting smarter, learning how to invest, learning how to plot our path forward, even when the market's a little bit weird. And today's guest, Neil Twa, you're one of those guys, dude. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing wonderful today. Thanks for having me on, Tyler. Man, it's absolutely my pleasure. And, and Neil, we're going to talk about how to view the market right now, how to make better choices, how to invest better. But I, I want to let my audience get to know you just a little bit. So, so you know, I, we have, we kind of laugh about this, Neil. Anytime you go from having some kind of a job, whatever that is, JV, mm -hmm. to owning a business, normally something is the catalyst. Something has either gone wrong or something mm -hmm. has happened. What was going on in your life where you decided, okay, time to hang a shingle and go build businesses? It was a... Um... It was just an opportunity in that moment to make a decision where I could have gone left or right. I could have gone uh, from that job. And, and that was about 17 years ago. I was at IBM. Uh, they decided to outsource part of my global services division to uh, Argentina and or I could reapply to different a different division and, and change it up. So I kind of had a, an idea where I could go to a, um, a different section of the business and get a job or I could basically take the early retirement. I didn't want to go to Argentina. That was the long short of it. So it was kind of a catalyst to like, well, what do I want to do? My wife and I had just gotten married. I gotten kind of that notice in January. We got married in March. Uh, and I knew that by June or so, they were going to be making that decision. That was sort of the scuttlebutt. And so I kind of had a couple of months to just decide, what do I want to do? Is this my chance? I'd always wanted to be in the entrepreneurial space 100%. But because the internet literally wasn't available and didn't become available until my later years in college, was there any opportunity to see it become a reality? And no one knew exactly what it was or how to do anything with it. So I chose the corporate route. Uh, and got a job in order to go where the money was. And I just followed it into the corporations because I was in academia at that point, and technically in school and could have stayed in that and, and learned that process. But I decided to go the corporate route instead. It's like the game of life, right? I went that trip. So I dropped out of college and followed it. I followed the internet and it led me to Sprint, um, where they became the uh, largest mobile division at that point, launching those uh, mobile phones into the market, which was really cool to watch because that blew up extremely fast uh, in five years. And then that led me to IBM where I learned about, you know, business and large scale business implementations and projects and, and you know, high tech and, uh, you know, in relationship dri driven business in more of a B2B format, which is what uh, IBM really taught me. So it was just a catalyst of realizing I had a choice to make, you know, stay on that path or right. do what I always intended to do, which was be more entrepreneurial. I just rode the corporate, you know, jockey world for as long as I could, never realizing or staying honestly that I wanted to stay in it for the long time, never realizing when that time would actually come to an end. So I needed, as you said, a catalyst at this point, I saw it as an opportunity, not that I was going to lose money and stop being an employee, but that was my opportunity to like spread my wings and go. And I did. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there is no perfect moment. I know people have said this, but honest to goodness, if I had looked forward in, in two years and been able to see what challenges were going to be there, my wife's health, my kids that came and the financial things and all those problems I did not see in the first two years, I probably would have stayed. Yeah. In the corporate no, I world. Think, I, I actually think honest. the same thing, by the way. Like we, we pivoted from job to entrepreneurship and immediately like had had a baby and business is harder than you think it's going to be and always more challenging yeah things stack up on top my wife you know we got pregnant in september of the same year and 
uh, discovered that. Yay, that's exciting. However, she had a lot of complications. And by December, she was on bed rest and couldn't work anymore. So all of a sudden, we were like, Row! all the income that would really two top tier professionals at that point had zero income by year two. So new baby on the way and then, a new business. <laughs> so like IBM to where, kind of where you are now with Voltage, yeah. how did that evolution happen? Oh man, pivots and churns, as I mentioned to you in the pre-show call, literally you follow the money, you follow the opportunity, you change, you go with it and you adapt. And so it's just a series of adaptations over the 17 years. I got into the management consulting after that because that was my skill set of business and development in six, uh, about seven months after I left IBM. They called me back to be a consultant on a project. They needed me for a year. They didn't want to hire me as an employee. So I said, here's my rate. They said, that's awesome. I said, wow, that's cool for me too. And so I went back to work because now it was a $250 an hour bill rate. So I did that for almost a year and then realized, well, I'm just trading more time for money. So I've got to stop doing that. It just was a nicer feeling. And I got to stop being the only loan man in it. So I started to hire consultants into my practice and got about 10 of them running by 2010. And so with them doing that, it freed up my time to do other things like business and development and networking. And I had to learn more about those skill sets. It's not the same in the corporate world. You have to relearn how to be everything in the business. And that was not something I knew how to do. And so I literally learned it on the job through trial and errors and opportunities and failures and, and discovered I was really good at the pay traffic and media side. I was really great at you know understanding the customer uh, the journey and the story and building a qualified sales process uh, with ethical sales boundaries because I'd hired a mentor who basically helped me understand that sales fixes everything and I couldn't be afraid to sell. I just had to learn to find the right person to sell to and that was a huge win. And so while that was going, I started playing online more and started learning how to do you know media and online buying. And that led me to physical products because I, I owned the offer, I owned the digital and I didn't own the physical, so I wanted to own the brand. And so I said, hey, let me own the whole thing. And so because I could do one, I decided to do the other. And I liked the physical product world because I could see it, it was tangible. I could take cash and put it into a physical object. It wasn't a purely digital based business model like I was running at that point. And so I said, let me own the products. And at that point, a friend of mine said, hey, if you're gonna own products, you should check out Amazon and check out this thing called Fulfilled by Amazon, FBA. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. He's like, it was eBay, I want nothing to do with it. He's like, no, 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 this is not eBay. They like handle the shipping, they handle the logistics, they handle all that stuff. You just keep doing what you're doing, which was basically demand response, direct marketing, You know, building up product, building an offer, building a solution, and keep doing that and let them handle all the physical products, delivery and everything. I'm like, well, that's kind of cool. I like that idea. So I just started flipping some products in Amazon in 2011, 2012, and realized I, I needed to create brands. Once I realized I could sell the products, I'm like, holy crap, I need to build a brand now. And between then, uh, around 2012 to 2014, we built a seven-figure um, private label brand on Amazon, and I was hooked. At that point, it was all about traffic and direct response and capturing the traffic of direct uh, demand capture from Amazon and got really good at it. Turns out they have a system. They have an automation, they have this technology running underneath it. And wouldn't you know it, I, it was almost exactly like the systems of automation learning and AI we were developing in the IBM days. And so to me, it suddenly became very familiar with what Amazon's ranking and search engine wanted. It was very similar to the programming and logistics of the operations and systems we created during my IBM days. And so I just kind of laid it out there and realized, oh, this system wants me to do this this way and that way and this way. And when it does, I get rewarded this way and that way. And I just did what it wanted. And all of a sudden we were blowing up brands faster than we could capitalize. I think that's uh, what's so cool about that story. And I, I relate to it some, Neil, is a lot of entrepreneurs that have been fortunate enough to build seven figure companies like, like you and I have, you kind of have this moment where you see the dots connect from the experiences you had earlier in your right. career and clarity, you know, like some of the things that I don't know, maybe even in college, I would have thought like, why am I different than the other guys in this way? Or why am I more interested in this part of the process than the other guys are like, ah, aha, there was, there was a bigger plan here because I got into the trenches of my second business or whatever, yeah. my first business and realized Oh man, Michael, I'll, I'll give you a concrete example. Like I have a degree in accounting. I don't even know that I like accounting that much. <laughs> Does that anybody fact. really like accounting? Let's be honest. I mean, let's sorry. be real. Yeah. Listen, yeah. The accountant that tells you they love accounting. I don't know. I don't know about that guy, but I think with the you know, business, we love the numbers. We don't always like the accounting because then somebody has to be paid and we owe something. That's why accounting isn't always fun. Ah, uh, there he is. Yeah. Uncle Sam being one of them, right? So oh, yeah. uh, listen, before we hit record, we're talking about sure. the market. The market's, uh, evolving it's flowing i think was the illustration you were using and i think that 
could be good news to the audience here today, Neil, but but give me so. your take on what you're yeah. seeing in the e-commerce landscape here in 2020. Well, I hope people will see it as an opportunity, right? As we had talked about any in market and shift, and if you look back 17 years, you're going to see a major real estate bubble challenge. You're going to see the COVID thing. You're going to see geo and economical pressures. You're going to see the stuff we're dealing with in 2024, ridden through all of that, right? Because e-commerce really as a digital, uh, both digital and physical product, is the oldest, literal oldest business model outside of prostitution, the barter and trade and movement of goods, right. and, okay, with services. It is the oldest. Digital and e-commerce is just a way to change that mechanism in which the transactional aspect of it occurs. But regardless, a physical product changes hands. So I want people to think about this, right? Because in terms of inflation and trans uh, transitory inflation and the things we're seeing now, you're still buying bread, I assume. You're still buying gas, right? You're still buying the commodities of life. You're still buying some of the things you want, even though the prices have gone up. Yes, we're complaining about it because it's not great. And we know that it can be changed if somebody's willing to change it, which clearly they're not willing to do right now. But the affect of it is we still consume those. So for me, physical products became that, you know, recession proof, translation proof, change proof opportunity to just shift with the product as the market shifted. And since I've watched that occurs from these many big changes, including the most recent major change, we had you know shipping and logistics freight costs that went from 45 to 5,500 up to 25 grand per container, major fluctuations and shift, right? right? And so I've seen some very dramatic things and I've seen the way e-commerce has evolved in that, the system evolved, the people, the buyer evolved, right? And for that reason, I know that honestly, any real changes in the uh, situation with our country or global effects are going to be positive for many people who are willing to uh, take advantage of that. And every major change, and you brought this up earlier, and every major change, including after the Great Depression, there was always people who made a lot of money because they positioned themselves in the more difficult times to do the things others were not willing to do because they knew the reward would eventually come. And if we're in a situation right now where you feel like money's not near you, if you feel like it's not close to you, it has moved away, well, then you need to move towards it. You need to plant your feet down and complain because you don't have it. You need to get up and move towards it. And right now, real estate and other things are having a lot more difficulty, you know, dialing in on numbers and opportunity and cash. And even some franchise opportunities are having troubles because of real estate and local realtor problems and just supply chain and elasticity of demand and locations based on the physical presence of these buildings, which we discovered was a big problem in a couple of years when everything locked down, right? But e-commerce itself doesn't have those problems, right? It flexes and flows with a much more dynamic, real-time, mobile-driven consumerism, which like 60% of people order on their mobile phones every week now. So the availability and movement of that is only growing greater. In fact, it's going to translate into about 21 trillion coming online. Bank of America and Forrester Research Study has predicted that's going to occur. And it's going to occur in probably the next 10 to 20 years, if not sooner. So you're either going to be a part of it from a consumer perspective, or you may get victimized it by inflation or other problems, or, or you might choose to get in the game and take it as an opportunity and watch yourself get slingshotted off the back of this because everything ebbs and flows. While it always goes up, it comes back down. And what we're watching in a lower period for some people right now is going to slingshot back up. If not in the next year or two years or three years, it's going to happen. Yeah. But Neil, but Neil, the aggregators, that, that time has passed and there's a million it products now. And, you know, oh man, like, is it, it's just too saturated now, Neil. We can't, we can't do it. We can't make a living building products. No one now. makes any money. There's no profit. Amazon steals everything. They'll take yeah. your product ideas and myth and myth and myth and myth. Are there problems? Has Amazon crossed barriers? Absolutely. Have they done it as a company holistically? No. Have they had bad actors inside of their business? Yes. Have we been impacted by bad actors inside of their business? Yes. Every corporation has its problems because it's all just a conglomeration of people. But as a right. corporate policy, they're not there to steal your brands. They want to actually help you grow your brands. This is the truth, right? Is there profit to be made? Yes, if you know the numbers. I know people focus on so many of the wrong numbers, the number of sales, the revenues, the idea of product and this hopium mindset that everything is gonna be resolved by one product, which it's not. So they, they get all of these grandiose ideas that are incorrectly stated that aren't based on the numbers. They don't do the data correctly. They don't account correctly for what it means to run a business by the numbers. They run it by gut feel. Products are always have the capability of being saturated, either in the market you enter or over time, they will become saturated. But one thing will not become saturated, and that is a brand, okay? The same way there are 10 burger joints, you can name them right now, 
Okay. There are plenty of brand opportunities for every person who's willing to attach themselves to a brand, but not a product to go to zero to hundred on products. Anybody can really do that in time to go to a brand in seven figures. It takes a whole different kind of strategy. And if you don't have that strategy, you're probably suffering because you think it's a tactical problem. It's not a tactical problem. I can teach a 19 year old high school dropout how to do this. Ask me how I know you can do it with the right strategy. So is the opportunity? Yes. What, for example, we don't play in products less than 50 to $200 in retail price point. We need profit margins with more than 12 and $24 in net profit per unit on every product ordered. We need products that aren't necessarily are going to be targeted below 10,000 in BSR. We want the products at 50 to hundred K because we want to enter the market, overtake the market, do better data and direct marketing in Amazon, and then slingshot past those other sellers before they even recognize we're there and they can't stop us. Okay. We want to put more products in the system by Amazon's own admission. 5% of SKUs in year one make up 5% of their entire retail. By year two, it's 20% of the entire retail. And by year three, it's 40% of Amazon's entire retail sales are products that are three years or less in age. What does that tell you? If you're not evolving and moving with the market and meeting with social demand and social commerce expectations of the marketplace, you're not going to take advantage of that. You're going to get complacent and not move forward. So you must reinvigorate brands and products that have two and three years in the marketplace, and you must launch additional products in the marketplace. So many sellers I've talked to have less than five SKUs in the marketplace. Five for us is just a starting block. Okay. Yep. 15 to 20 is much better. Yes, the aggregates have died. Consolidation, capitulation, and problems were all there. We raised $100 million in funds to go become an aggregator in a portfolio division of Voltage. By 2021, I shut it down. My partner came to me and said, uh, no, the numbers are not working. Everything is penciling in like 40 to 50% above market value. We cannot buy at that price point because if anything changes in the next 24 months, all of these businesses are going to go insolvent. And I listened to him. He's been with me for 12 years. I'm like, yeah, dude, you got it. I'd hate to say this, but I'm telling everybody now we're not doing this anymore. <laughs> it took me 18 months to get to that point. And then we had to shut the whole thing down. But it was the right move. So now what is the move? Because money is moving and it's changing like a river, like Amazon's a river, but it changes and flows, is going into acquisitions. So now we are actually acquiring a you know very consolidated level of brands in a specific area and a specific price point of profitability and growth. And we're shooting for five uh, this year because the market has come down and it's now a buyer friendly market. Okay. And sellers are willing to offer additional financing and other opportunities they weren't willing to offer two years ago because of the way the aggregators were positioning the market. A lot of them have consolidated. Some of them are going to be investigated for problems with SEC funds and a whole lot of other nonsense. And so now it's time to actually go back in the market because there's blood in the streets, to borrow a Warren Buffett face. And as he also said, I believe when the whenever the ocean goes out, you find out who's wearing a swimsuit, right? Yep. Uh, and right now, a lot of them have been exposed. They were terrible operators. They were only moving funds from one section to another. They were operating, operating terrible brands with products that were like sub $12 in retail price point. Right. Uh, and I don't know who was acquiring this, but they couldn't operate it. They had like 125 job wrecks open, open at any one point and could not find anybody to actually operate the businesses. Yeah, so, I was talking yeah. to a friend of mine, Neil, uh, about that. I was I was uh, in another yeah. country speaking at a conference and talked to a friend of mine who was hired by one of these really large aggregators. I was like, so what was like what did the what was that process like of getting hired? And he's like, well, actually, it was no process. They literally uh, knew that I'd never worked anything related to Amazon ever, you know. But they put me in charge of this entire region's brands. You know, it's it amazing how um, how quickly they were they were brought in and, and put to work. Um, so, yeah. hey, you mentioned a couple of things. You opened the door. I've got to walk through it as a CFO. So when you're assessing brands, I want to KPI talk here for a second. Number, I have a two-part question. What are you looking for when it comes to a brand being elite in terms of how it's performing right now? What's your kind of pet KPI or two KPIs? And, and maybe a tag along to that question is, how are you seeing your pet KPIs kind of trend with the brands that you're closest to here in 2024? Yep. So for a business we're looking to acquire, uh, it must have one to three million or more in EBITDA within it. Okay. It must yep. at least maintain at least an 18 to 20% net profit margin, preferably higher or a path to get there if lower. In other words, we see it in the maybe the change in management operations, change in product opportunities, change in management structure of the way they're doing their vendor uh, support, manufacturing support and cost of goods and anything we can impact through our supply chain that maybe they can't. And we can see that turn around relatively fast in the first 90 to 180 days. 
those are some of the metrics we're looking at for valuation, right? They PPC numbers for us don't always factor in, although some people talk about it. Well, you know, if they have a 58% A cost, if we can get it to 30% A cost, this will make a huge difference. I'm not fine. If the A cost is 58%, but the total advertising cost is between between 8 to 15%, then we're going to go acquire more. I'm going to say less about that and not want to take what I see a lot of people try to change on that front end acquisition. I'm going to turn it into CLTV. I'm going to turn it into what is possible for this brand, if not currently there, to achieve a customer lifetime value of $1,000 in 12 months from the products that are currently in this space, subscribe and save or additional mechanisms to make that occur so that we are acquiring a customer who could spend up to you know $1,000 with us in a 12 month period. Why the specificity of that? Because Amazon's own Prime member stats say that a Prime member will spend $1,000 with Amazon in a 12-month period, okay? So if I know that's the stat, that's the standard for the system, and they are doing everything possible to maintain or grow that, I want to get in line with it. People yeah. were like, well, then how many products do I need? Oh, well, I can sell one $1,000 product to one person, <laughs> right? Or 10 $100 products, you do the math. And I can say that each customer along the way through either a single point of acquisition or multiple points of acquisition in the product line base that I have or subscribe and save up to or equivalent to 1000 or more is the basis of the value of that company. Why? Because you're in 24 uh, now and then moving into 25 and then 26, I already know that the system maturity for three years is up to 40% of Amazon's all retail sales. So what am I going to do with those numbers? I'm going to go in and intentionally budget growth in product line and growth in market line and growth in CLTV to meet those numbers by year two and three, because the whole system is set up to increase me from 20 to 40% by year two and three. Those are the numbers I find most valuable. That's helpful though. I, I, the, the one thing that you mentioned there that I hadn't thought about is really honing on a lifetime value. I loved, by the way, you said a lot there earlier, Neil, but one of the things you said that when I'm, coaching. I, I also sit on the board for a small aggregator who our, our best competitor, Neil, Neil and I, inside baseball guys, we were meeting a month ago and we were laughing about our core competitive advantage for these aggregators that we represent being that we were late and slow. If yeah. we hadn't been late and slow, we probably would have lost a lot of money making the same mistakes True that some story. of the other guys made. But being late and slow made it to where we bought healthier brands and we were slower to acquire them. And so, Correct. you know, something I love that you were focused on is having a higher price point that that having a retail price that's more than 50 bucks is a real winner for a lot of our even just my personal CFO clients. Yeah. And then to your point, how can we add something? I'll give you an example of this. One of the best exits that we saw out of my portfolio over the last three years was a brand that sells a nice, juicy four or five hundred dollar product that goes in your home. But that product needs a filter that's replaced regularly. And so by selling the product, it was a nice premium product and having a recurring uh, subscribe and save, you know, funnel for sales yep. beyond it at a very high profit margin. Um, it made the product stickier, the, the filters like fit with other versions of the model. And it very much created a brand experience that allowed this company to get a monster seven, eight X kind of multiple when they exited. And so, yeah, yeah, it's good, man. I mean, anything else you'd say about that in terms of just like understanding the health of a brand, obviously a lot of people listen to this right? yeah. and acquires, but yeah, but growth, what, how do you do that? Sure. Growth organically in Amazon is important because it is a demand capture platform. Now, when I came on to it, it was a demand discovery platform that has since shifted and a lot of social commerce has come up in the last 10 years, including TikTok shops and others and the social media reels and all the things that have created this the demand uh, creation. Okay, for products, and I saw it on a video and this kind of stuff. So Amazon's really become that halo effect where everybody, it goes across some platform somewhere, touches a product and then ends up on Amazon over 30% of the time trying, deciding if they wanna buy the product over there instead and acquiring it through that channel they trust already. So it is demand creation one end and demand capture on the Amazon. When you understand that, you have to realize that with 8,600 units a minute, right? 8,600 units a minute moving through Amazon. If you think you've caught the demand on Amazon already, which means you should take your focus and time off to other channels, then you've usually missed it. You've usually missed it. I had a friend uh, come into our, uh, he's a friend now, he was a client before, David came through and had a similar thought process and had the wrong strategy in mind. Thinking that 
he would get his products up on Amazon and then he would do all these other activities to try to increase subscriptions or subscribe and save or profits or purchases on Amazon. So he's wasting all this time and money doing all these other marketing things around Amazon to, in essence, influence Amazon to increase his product ranking. OK, it never worked and it never will. Why? Because it's usually done at the wrong time. So the right time to do it is when you know for a fact that you are correctly capturing demand in Amazon, typically 20 to, to uh, 30 percent organic growth every year in the system is a triggering mechanism in which you know you are capturing the correct demand on Amazon. Okay, If you get up to 30, 40, 50 percent, it just goes faster, of course. It means that you are in line with capturing the rest of the demand uh, in there that other market share has already been taken by competitors that you just haven't got to yet. Okay. David came in, we retaught him this strategy, he lost a couple hundred grand in the first six months trying to figure it out on his own. And four months, five months later, we had him net positive 200 grand. And 18 months later, he emailed me this weekend, it's July 4th weekend. And he said, hey, I'm on vacation in Italy. And by the way, June was our largest month at half a million in sales. Okay, so he went from zero 200 in the hole to 200 profitable to now a half a million dollar a year business on Amazon only. He stopped all the other activities and just focus on capturing the organic and demand creation of that product inside of Amazon first. And now he's gonna be moving into other, now is the time for him to start moving into other channels where demand creation is now gonna be caught back on Amazon. So he'll be at another 18 months or less, probably less now, he'll be at a million a month. It's just time to mark right. now. By the way, a, a reframing of what you just said, Neil, and I think this is this was a real uh, this is a problem that a lot of entrepreneurs have. We get we get the entrepreneurial seizure. We get um, we get interested in new shiny objects, and and instead of kind of whole assing one thing, we half ass five things. And, uh -huh. the, and the net impact of that is that we don't do anything well. And I do think that's right. A couple of things you mentioned I think are really important. One is the opportunity on Amazon is huge. I think that if you are trying to do it well and you're not mastering it, master it. You need and then, to, and to your point, it doesn't mean you don't ever have permission to go launch your Shopify or TikTok store. Like you have permission, but get the first thing right first. And then I think your product roadmap that you mentioned early on is on maybe your second step. And then maybe your third step is then to uh, to look at other channels. And, and It is. And it's when I usually want people to have more than six to high six to seven figures on Amazon captured in market share and demand and money and time, energy and attention to get that grown and then take the time, energy, attention, and money to open an additional channel where they'll create that demand, which takes a whole nother skill set. So it's got to be learned. Usually it's got to be adapted or trained or hired into the business. And that's a whole nother process has to be learned, right? But focus on one channel until successful. And Amazon is a channel by which this gentleman's competitors who I have consulted with are doing 100,000 units a month. And I said, by no means are you anywhere near their market share. If you want to get anywhere near it, this is the only thing you're going to focus on right now and stay focused on until you get above a certain point, and then it will make sense to move. And I'm glad he listened because what he was missing was the strategy. Guys, there are tactics and tactical hacks and all this tactic, tactic, tactic stuff. Well, we do this and we tweak this and we manipulate this and we get this off Amazon funnel and stuff. More than often, you are simply not aligned with Amazon's system itself to become the top tier seller, right? You are just not in the best position. I'm not talking about best seller badges. I don't care about that. It's vanity metric. I don't care about how many units you move. I care about how profitable it is. And from there, you can then acquire customers. People get this wrong. And then I'll know 10 other products I can sell that maybe each move, you know, 500 units a month. That's it. But they're extremely profitable. So I go get 10 of those. Right. I repeat the process by growing the vertical out wide. And I will do it very different than others will do. And then, of course, the cream of the crop rises to the top. Some of those brands and products will take off. Right. It's a law of averages. They will take off. And then you will know where to spend your time and capital. And then it's just a matter of double downing and focus. It, the pro tip that most people completely miss, and you probably know this, Tyler, is once you're dialed in and your algorithm is good and you are set in the organic and all of your data is good, if not better than your top market share competitors in your node, it is your inventory that is holding you back. The only way for you to get Amazon system to level you up to their market share and move that unit is if you capitalize the inventory and actually feed the beast. You're actually holding it back. If you think you can sell their market share because you went and got an extra 5,000 units at the top end of some of these nodes, you're not going to do it. They had 10, 15, 20,000 or more units in stock. You have mm -hmm. to meet or exceed them. Otherwise, the system will not allow you to take that market share. It won't send you the impressions and clicks required to make the sales. You won't get it. You just can't. And you can't manipulate it from off Amazon. They don't like that. Mm -hmm. They won't like that. What they like, though, is if you're becoming the dominant data set, 
in this big engine, because that's what it is, a big data engine, yep. then they will reward you when you feed the machine. And you will be, take that data set and simply get better positioned above your competitors because now you have more inventory, which means you're meeting their market demand for their customers. You get that fundamental piece right there as the entire understanding of your strategy and it's game over. You become a David. Neil, what is your current take on hit rate for new product launches? So you kind of mentioned this. Some you're going to launch products. Some are going to work yep. better than others. The heroes, the cream's going to rise. Correct. What are you yep. seeing in the last 12, 24 months in terms of hit rate? So I have, uh, my methodology hasn't changed. It's my five by five methodology, five by five product launch playbook. We will launch five products in the system, okay? We will launch a hundred unit tests of each of those products to define in a market brand and segment, which of the products this person wants. And it cannot be defined exactly by one existing in the market, but it is gonna be defined by my version of that one existing in the market as to whether or not I can sell it or even sell it better than them which will then allow me the understanding and the data to go order a thousand units and do a full product launch, a customized product launch. It means changing the packaging, changing the product and actually going for a full 1000. That means I move from a, a soft market launch, okay, to prove the product can sell. Remember sales fixes everything to an actual full product launch out of revenue and into profit. Once that 1000 units goes in, uh, once I've gotten more reviews, once I've moved forward, then I will not still not marry the product until I see the velocity of that 1000 units moving in the system as reviews come in and as time and market occurs past 90 days and 180 days. That data set tells me everything I need to know between whether I order 5000 or a 40 foot container next. And then I have my year to date annual run rate. So I know that out of five products, two to th two of them, usually one to two of them will be the hero products. Once I have those, I have now created a cylinder not a funnel, I've created a cylinder. And then I will take that and replicate those products because it again, more products in the system to more people, okay, meets them in demand of the same product base going across. If you got an iWatch, you got an iPhone, you got an Apple Pro Mac, you got the desktop, you got the, uh, we're just gonna fall retail mm -hmm. and we're gonna go boringly wide across all of those same products and capture every bit of that other market share that wants some other variation of that same product from the hero products that we found. And then it's like success is shooting fish in a barrel. Every product I put in is gonna sell. The question is which ones sell the faster velocity and then focus all the intention and time. And like a CFO, once those get across a certain line on the bottom and they are not performing above the ones above our uh, specific line, we let them sell out of inventory. Why? Because even if the whole seller account is provided green lit, you know, seller health dashboard, what you may not understand is those lower performing products and SKUs hanging out with 50 units compared to the one with 5,000 or 10,000 units is going to drag your entire seller health down. And once you remove those bottom line products by letting them finalize and sell out and only have your top selling products inside of your seller account, watch what happens in 30 days, just 30 days. Once those are sold out and closed up and you, you it's all green dash, so you're like, well, how is this possible, Neil? Try, try 12 years of experience. Once you get rid of those products in your system, you will watch the entire lift of that seller account throw your business through the roof. And then you're gonna have to capitalize fast. And, and by the way, to put like the financial spend on that same, by the way, I love that. I love that point because this gets to the core of my, my soapbox in the industry, Neil, which is yep. we gotta focus on return on capital invested and Correct. not invest in underperforming products. So you think about the double benefit of what Neil just said there. If you, we can find our bottom feeders and get over the kind of FOMO and fear of killing a product that might sell for a day or something like that, we get the benefit of our account being uh, favorably treated by Amazon's algorithm. In addition to that, guys, we get to redeploy that capital. I don't, I don't have to go borrow that money again. No, no, just redeploy it's for speed. Remember year two and year three. So everything we're talking about in my five by five is year one so that you are then moving another five products in by year two because each market you're going to get a five percent and a 20 percent and a 40 percent jump so the more products you put in the faster that snowball starts to juggernaut down and pretty soon again 18 months to 24 months in like like potentially uh daniel and david and adam and the others that have just done this you'll watch the reciprocal benefits of that come you just got to have the teeth to move and stay in that marketplace and watch what happens, right? So Neil, I know that Voltage and you have some other, pro you have a great book. Like like if somebody listening to this is like, man, I'm like, Neil is blowing my mind. I, I wanna learn more about how Neil approaches this stuff. Like what, what, what would your advice be to them? How can somebody connect with you to learn more about your process? 
Well, first up, a gift to anybody who's listening to the to the first 10 people who come on here right now. We've got a code uh, that you guys can use for the book. That's your If you're a book reader, that may be your next stop, right? You can go to voltagedm.com forward slash book and use the code. I think it's Tyler Jeff code. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, so Tyler Jeff code, full name, that's your code. And that will give you a free version of my book. You might want to digest that and read it. That might, it might, you know, might be your next stop, okay? There's education in there. It's 15 other experts. Uh, that I interviewed on my podcast that combined the five by five experience and everything from image and graphics to accounting to business development of the products and the optimizations of the listings and the PPC management. There's a whole lot of real good strategy that follows that in there. That might be your next step. We're anywhere on voltagedm.com. Check out the podcast. I got a high voltage business builders podcast. You can learn a little bit more about the way we think and do. There's a presentation on there that explains the business model of how we work with people for uh, 12 months. It's an invitation only group of uh, clients. And maybe that's your next stop or check me out on social media. I'm all over the place. You might find you like me or don't like my views, but that's okay. Uh, Cause I love my social media <laughs> and I'm on Facebook and Instagram and X and all those places. And you might find that's a good place for you to connect as well. You know, that's great. And so guys, for those of you maybe seeing this on YouTube or, or listening to the podcast, I will make sure that my team puts these links that Neil just um, described in the various show notes. If you want, a, I mean, it sounds like you get a free copy of this book. I'm giving away 10 free copies to your followers right now. Anybody, uh, right. the 10 codes will go in and then, then it's done. <laughs> that's all we got. Okay. Well guys, take him up on that free offer. And then Neil, just such a wealth of, of information. I love how clear you are as a marketing strategist and thinker. And um, hey, I, I always just ask my guests mm -hmm. because I'm trying to get better. I like to surround myself with people who are killing it. You're one of those. Is there a habit, hack, process, life rhythm that gives you an, just an outrageous return on investment that you'd love to share with the audience? Yeah, I think, um, well, the one that really translated my brain about three to four years after I got started in my own business was the, a, a book that was given to me by a friend. It was called Feel the Fear and Do It Anyways by Susan Jeffries. And that really stuck to me. And part of the thing in that book was to address the fears we have and the ways we can cope or deal with them or get past them. And one of the questions that was asked and that it sort of always stuck with me uh, was what was the worst that can happen? Like it's easy for our minds sometimes to think about the bad things that can happen. It's really hard for us at times to think in abundance about what's the actually really good thing that could happen to us if we stay here because it's harder to sometimes recognize that when right. scarcity of money and time and, and other things are, are playing at you or if you're a family man or a woman and you've got kids and life, things bearing down on you. But it really was what's the worst that can happen? And once you speak it out there and you name it and understood, okay, this is the worst that can happen, all right? then you realize what it's possible for you to do to avoid or get around it or to bring the abundance of opportunities to you by removing and speaking out the scarcity uh, and start speaking in the abundance. It's very powerful. It's really simple to do. It's something that actually takes you a, a daily effort to get up and do. And every day I get up and I'm reminded and I thank you, you know, God for the blessings that I have, my family, the things I've got around me. Uh, the time that he's given me again to be here to continue to to spread this and help people and use my business as a mission uh, to to get this message out there, and that is that you know there are worse things that can happen than the ones you probably think are going to happen. I have had divorce. I've had my uh, uh, challenges in life. I've gone bankrupt. My uh, lovely wife I've been with for 19 years. She died in front of me in the hospital room, and then I had you know, three surgeries to save her life. And I thought I was going to be a dad with you know four kids under the age of five on my own. So I have met a lot of my worst fears head on uh, in my life and dealt with them. And I can tell you, you know, I'm still alive. So you know, every other opportunity is an opportunity to do better. And I hope that today that you will take whatever challenges you have and try to reframe them into abundance because that's the biggest life hack that no one can ever take with you as a force of to be reckoned with when you will are an unstoppable person who will not take no for an answer. Love it. And name the book one more time. What was the book called? Feel the fear and do it anyways. Feel the fear and do it anyways. Neil Twa from Voltage. Man, you're a monster, dude. Thank you so much for joining Return on Podcast today. We'll definitely have to have you back at some point. I very much appreciate your energy and your wisdom here. Thanks for having me on, Tyler. I appreciate it, brother. Listen, guys, for anyone who's made it, almost 40 minutes into this episode, here's what Neil and I want to tell you is that we appreciate it. Your investment of energy is, is meaningful to us. We hope you glean a couple of nuggets that make your life and business better. You're going to make sure you have links to, to Neil's uh, social medias and ways to get a hold of Voltage if you want to learn more about his programs. Take him up on that offer. First 10 people to use my name, Tyler Jeffcoat, as the code there on the website. We'll get the book for free. And until we see you guys next week, hope you kill it. Take care. Bye.